fans and welcome to the season finale of two legs a paul mccartney podcast we are a paul mccartney talk show mainly dealing with paul's solo career i'm one of your two co-hosts tom hunyadi and as always i'm joined by my my cousin my partner in crime my buddy you know whatever he's uh, my confidant if you will uh he is david gargolino david what's going on what's up tom let's not elect wings into the hall of fame hunyadi Wow, jeez. This is the last episode of the season, buddy. You know. Right, you know. <laughs> man. Yeah. Man. Yeah, I know. Listen, hey, I, we'll talk about it more in a no, second. Oh, but... No, I want to get it all. Let's get it all. Right, listen, ch- listen. I to watched me. your listen. damn show on Monday, and I was right, like. Right, listen. Okay, so <laughs> are you like the 99% of everybody that goes to shows just to see Paul? Or, you know, if you went hey, to go hey, rock, I, I enjoyed the Denny show. Lane show I, more than I have, yeah, yeah. honestly, than the last couple Paul McCartney shows. Well, that was because it was your first time seeing Denny Lane. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you got tell me. The let's, let's elect what? him to the Hall of Fame of a band that which was a cover and he was on one album and the right. band isn't necessarily known for that. You know, right, right. I'm just right. playing with you, Tom. In 1976, during the tour, how many people do you think were actually going to see Paul McCartney or, let's say, uh, a yeah. Jimmy? You know, I, come yeah. on. Yeah, this, but they're yeah, not, how many times? But you, Denny and Linda many, are not side people. They were of the core group. So um, I agree with you there. Yeah. I agree with you there. there just but you relegate you relegate Wings into a, a footnote of Paul McCartney's career. Which well, listen. I mean, he it's sold not out. My, he I, sold out the Seattle Dome. I mean. Yeah, listen, it's not my doing. I mean, <laughs> I how was how was Egypt Station announced as 18 solo album, which means that they canceled out the whole Wings period, which yeah. means this Wings era was its own. Yeah, you, you know, you agree with me on that? I get, I get it. Yeah, I do. I mean, but it is possible to go see a band for just one person, especially if that person is Paul McCartney. <sighs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, I mean, how many times <laughs> have you seen Rush? How many times have you seen Rush? Seven. Okay, and how many people did you see air drumming to Neil Peart? <laughs> a lot. Yeah, okay, so I'm sure all those people went just to go see Neil Peart. <laughs> Anyways, um, we've, got, we've, got a, we've got a special guest, a uh, guest I've been looking forward to having on the show for some time. He is the author of Beetle Tunes, the real story behind the cartoon Beatles. He was a part of the first... Beatles talk show podcast, if you will, called Fab Forum. And he's also now part of the very popular podcast, Fab Four Free For All. He is Mitchell Axelrod. Mitch, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. And don't get me started on that question. <laughs> because I, just, I don't want to go there. But well, anyway. just, just give us a hint of what your, what you, how your feelings well, are. <laughs> and you know what? I'm, I'm sorry, David, but I, I, I don't elect them because – you said something really interesting. You said, you know, if you do that, then you relegate Wings to, you know, nothing in his career. But Paul often himself relegate, you know, relegates Wings to nothing in his career. That's yeah. unfortunate, uh, it, especially it, in his live it, shows right now. It, I agree. I agree. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's a weird thing. I, I do agree with Tom that, you know, if you're going to a Paul show, you're going to see Paul. And even when people saw Wings, you weren't saying, wow, I can't wait for Linda to do Cook of the House. <laughs> so, you know, and yes, well, Linda would have been was, waiting a long time. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that's true, too. But yeah. listen, Wings was an incredible part of Paul's uh, career, for better or for worse, because they did have, uh, you know, some bumps along the road. But, um, you know, it was either Wings or it was Paul McCartney and Wings. It right. wasn't, you know, just uh, Wings. It, I know it was Wings at the speed of sound, but 
people knew that Paul McCartney was in that group. Well, by that time, yeah. I mean, yeah. because you know, with the with the with the not such with the lackluster sales of of uh, wildlife. I mean, I, what Capital wanted him to switch it to Paul McCartney and Wings. Yeah, and yeah. then. You know, for, well, for retro speed on the album that said Paul McCartney on M Wings. Yeah, they and then, and then there, so. right, and Band on the Run was also Paul McCartney yeah. and Wings. Yeah, I guess so, you're not you're not putting the Elephant's Memory Band in you know the Hall of Fame with John Lennon or. Oh or my god! <laughs> wow, is that a? I was going to say a horse of a different color, but it's an elephant right. of a different color. <laughs> right. Also, you know what I found fascinating was is looking up at the, I was on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame website uh, earlier today because I was kind of curious about something, and. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I mean, were they a band? I thought they were. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, do you know it's just Crosby, Stills, and Nash that's inducted? Mm. None of the band members were inducted. <laughs> well, if you think about it, though, um, in that case, I don't think any of their solo careers merit um, each individual member being in. No, I don't. I, I don't either. I mean, because look at all the, I mean, you got Stills with Young once, I think, and then you got um, Crosby and Nash, uh, you know, a few times. Right. So, you know, I, I think it all just merges in, in, into one, and I'm fine with that. But, you know, on those Crosby, Stills, and Nash albums, I mean, there's other musicians playing, uh, you know, on those records. Um, Listen, there's so many more important people to put in than Wings, mm -hmm. like Janet Jackson. I'm oh, kidding. Yeah. Um, ah, there I'm, you go. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Oh, there's the wit. That, uh, there's the wit. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. I so definitely it, agree. It's Deeper. a tough call. They, listen, they they had a lot of good albums, but they really were, you know, maybe I, I can't even say eight years. It wasn't even eight years for them. Um, and Paul's had such a long career. And where do you stop? You know, right. Paul's in with the Beatles. Paul's in as a solo. You're gonna have Paul in with Wings. And right. you know, I, I I don't know. It it just gets a little con the whole. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is a different subject. Don't right. get me started, but right. Well, you know, well, I mean, one of, I mean, during the show, uh, uh, you know, a person watching pointed out that, uh, you know, his his Wings career is included in his in you know in in that induction. Um, and if Wings were to be you know inducted into the Hall of Fame, it would have to be like the E Street Band was inducted into the Hall of Fame as right. you know as musicians, kind of well, like you know. Though. As Ringo was put in. Yeah, he, exactly. He don't realize he's not in there like George. Yeah, no, and it's John like uh, absolutely. musicianship or his yep. excellence. He's a side man, yeah. Yes, exactly. And I was and I double checked on that uh, the other day as well, and it's absolutely true. He's not in like he thinks he is as you know, for his career. But thanks which, to Paul, yeah. he put you know he pushed that. Yeah. Yes, and and Ringo, I love Ringo. Ringo's the reason I became a drummer. And believe me, I love Ringo. But right. uh, Ringo's solo career, come on. I mean, after right. after the maybe Good Night Vienna, mm -hmm. and even maybe after Ringo, uh, th there's not much to talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've listened to you know your your episodes on you know Ringo's. Uh, you know, when you guys have looked back on Ringo's uh, career. Hey, I love albums. Bad Boy. But hey, I think Bad I'm... Boy's great, in my opinion. <laughs> But yeah, it's not you know, a Hall of Fame. Wow! Really. All right, so it's been nice talking to you guys. <laughs> All right. I, I go. like I like this right, I like yeah, the seventies David charm of that. So yeah. not gonna. <laughs> there is some charm, uh, but I think it was pickled in a bottle. So. Speaking of of Ringo albums, uh, we had an unfortunate uh, death today. Um, it's what June six, um, and today we learned the pa of the passing of of Doctor John, who. Uh, Apparently he had a heart attack at 77. Um, you know, I went back and I listened to um, uh, his version of Let Him In from uh, the, uh, you know, Artem McCartney. I can't say that it's one of my go-to songs when I do listen to that, you know, but... And not, and, yeah, but you know, I'm honest with you, I've, I've never been a big fan of his voice, but I, I appreciate his, too his musicianship. Too, yeah, too I, well, yeah. Too Jack for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, you know, he, he put uh, Louisiana on the map, you know, sort of say, yeah. uh, you know, musicianship wise. So um, and he was a part of Ringo's first uh, all star band. So there is a you know pretty big connection with uh, Beatle connection with uh, Dr. John. So, yeah, uh, it's a sad day. I mean, he yeah. definitely put the music, uh, you know, of New Orleans on his back. I mean, he was such a good musician. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do, you know, in the seventies growing up, I'm a little older than you guys, I guess. And uh, a little bit. <laughs> right time, wrong place, whatever it was. Yeah. That was right. such a fun song to hear as a single. Mm -hmm. Um it was cool. He never really had the success after that of 
you know, that, that or the, the chart success. But uh, and also his version of Ico Ico from the All Star Band was yeah. probably, you know, I think 30 minutes long. <laughs> right. uh, but it was, it was fun. And uh, he, it is a sad day because he was great, a great musician. Yeah, yeah, I'm a very big fan of the uh, the Last Waltz uh, concert film, and sure. uh, um, you know his um, uh, his uh, contribution to the uh, um, or song, if you will, uh, to that concert. I, I think is is stellar, just like the whole show is. Um, so that's unfortunate. He will be missed, and. Um, yeah. So, you know, Mitch, uh, like I said earlier, you know, um, you know, been looking forward to having having you on uh, for a while now. Finally got a hold of you. And uh, um, and I'm, I'm glad this uh, was able to work out. Um, let's um, talk about before we get into our main topic, which, you know, is going to be uh, McCartney mistakes throughout his solo career. Um, we're going to try to keep it you know, not so negative, but kind of like on a positive. We'll see how it turns out. But... No, it'll be positive. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, of well, course. Positive I mean... that he's, he has had mistakes. No. Right, yes. <laughs> but, you know, where, where would we be without constructive criticism, you know? Absolutely. Yes. Um, what do you think forums so... are about? You know, yeah. it's bitching. It's a bitch fest. <laughs> It's yeah, a way it to is. get you know, out of work. Just, uh, yeah. yeah, but it's also a way to find out that we are getting Abbey Road 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some insiders Maybe. over there. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, there are. I mean, what do you? Well, I mean, David, how do you feel about this? If we do get the uh, a U.S. box uh, vinyl, vinyl. Yeah, I can't is. get rid of my originals fast enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have, I have. Vinyl. Yeah, U.S. box vinyl. What do you mean? Huh? Well, oh. the new well, mystery box, that's a rumor? Yeah. Yeah, that's a rumor. It's just, yeah, we like to follow rumors from time <laughs> to time. <laughs> it's a rumor. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've heard rumors on certain boards, and uh, if it's if it's true, uh, like David said, kind of a yawn, but yeah. um, let's see what happens. Right. Well, Speaking of U.S. albums, you know, you becoming I, I want to talk about you becoming a, a, a Beatles fan. Sure. Obviously, sure. Yeah, like you said, you are a little bit older than us. And uh, don't keep saying you know, that. I'm going to yeah, hang right. up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so so fill us in. You know, what what happened? You know, you know, talk to us about becoming a Beatles fan. Sure. Um, you know, 1964, obviously, the Beatles come here and. Right. Um, my mom was in, in her 20s, and like any other uh, woman of that, of that <laughs> time, she loved Paul McCartney. Okay. And, uh, she, she sat me down, and we have 8 millimeter movies of me watching The Sullivan Show. Wow. wow. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I was two years old, and uh, so I just gave away my age. I'm 57 <laughs> now. <Okay. laughs> but honestly, that, that really made an impression on me. I mean, there's... I do have pictures that I think maybe you've seen on our site of mm-hmm. me at the age of three with my Beatles sweatshirt on, yep. um, dancing with my Beatles guitar. So, you know, it was a big influence she was on my becoming a Beatles fan. And then, uh, you know, later on, as I guess we'll talk about too, the um, the cartoons, which were on when I was three. And, right. I, and I really, I know people say they don't have memories when they're a kid, little kid. But I do. I, I literally have memories of watching the cartoons up through, you know, 1969 when they finally went off the air. They were in reruns, but right. uh, I was seven at that time. So, you know, from 65 to nine, I, I have very vivid memories of all that. And then the other good thing was that my my father's friend, Bernie, was a uh, the owner of in New York that had something called Times Square stores. Uh, it was a department store, you know like any other department store around the country, like Walmart. But uh, my father's friend owned the record shop at TSS, as it's named. And uh, so he used to give me Beatle records a couple of weeks before they would go out to the public. Oh, wow. So, uh, cool. Yeah, so we, I'd get them a little in advance, and uh, and I remember getting them. And, uh, and also, my parents were pretty hip, so they would go out and buy me all the magazines. Right. We, when the death clue came in 69, my mom and I would sit, and read the daily news here in New York, uh, mm-hmm. and because they had almost nightly a new clue for you know for each uh, death clue that we had, and there were so many, so it was published. So it was you know my parents, especially my mom, uh, right. was a really big influence in, in my life in terms of getting me to be a Beatle fan. Right. Yeah, I love it when it's a family member that yeah you know, kind of like passes it down. 
you know, sure. whether you know whether it's their their son or nephew or 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 whatever. I I think that's yeah. really really something special. Um, you know, speaking of getting things in advance, I mean, you still from time to time get you know things in advance now to review. Um, sure. You know, which is which is cool. You know, um, one of the fun things about um, about your podcast. But talk about the the cartoons here for for a minute. I mean, what was it that was it just the silliness of the of the cartoon that or was it just you know you'd right place at the right time right age and, and the right time you know, for no, you know what? It, it was it was just the fact that it was i was young it was cartoons which every kid on saturday morning not anymore because they're not there are no more cartoons on saturday morning but you know saturday morning cartoons whether right. it was Beatles or not was really big in the 60s and and even the 70s and even yeah. in the 80s, in the 80s but, yeah. yeah absolutely but um, in the 60s, it was cartoons. It was the music I absolutely loved. And it was always the music with the Beatles. Come on. I mean, yeah. and you know what? It didn't matter that they were playing, you know, B-sides and album tracks that people really weren't familiar with. It was still Beatle music, which was always good. And it was cartoons. How could you miss with that? Right. <laughs> exactly. Now, you said it, it went up until 69. And yeah. you're, what, seven, I believe? Seven yeah. going on eight or something like that. So when is the... You, and you, they go off the air. I mean, you got to be a little devastated, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, when's the next time that you actually get to see the cartoons again? Well, that's a, pretty interesting because they went off in 69. My mm. parents actually got divorced in 70. And then we had a, a tragic event in the family when my aunt and uncle passed away in a plane crash, oh. uh, unfortunately. And I had to move uh, to a different part down to Long Island. And it was just a devastating time between that and the divorce and – uh, all of a sudden, uh, in 19, I think it was 72, or I forgot which exact year, but uh, the Beatle cartoons were put on syndication uh, on Channel 5 here in New York, WNEW. And it was almost like someone was calling me. You know, it, they, mm -hmm. they, they came back on uh, at 8.30 in the morning, right before I was supposed to go to school, so I was late a lot. Um, <laughs> and there were no VCRs and all that. Right. Good stuff oh, yeah. But it was that was kind of cool. So it was almost like a, a feeling of being home again and getting a sense of normalcy in the midst of all my family craziness and, and hectic stuff that was going on around me. Right. So then now let's talk about um, let's get into the book a little bit, because I, you know, I'm kind of curious about how something like that w would get started when there is no you know, literature on that subject. You're the first person to to write about maybe, you know, besides, you know, newspaper articles or magazine articles. I, you know, I don't know. But what I mean, why write about the Beatle tunes? Were you that, you know, much in love with them that you felt that I just want to know more? You know, how you know, how did that process begin for you? Well, two things. It was it was my love for the cartoons, which I did think, even though they were silly, but I was a kid, so it didn't matter. But I thought they were silly. And fun, but also Beatle music. But right. uh, also, I, I was a, I'm a writer. I do write songs and lyrics and poems. And okay. I, wanted to, I wanted to have a creative outlet for my writing. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book on the Beatles. But there's thousands of books on the Beatles. What has not been covered? Right. And uh, the cartoons were always and still are dismissed to this day as, you know, as hokey, as silly. But they were a huge part of what made a lot of people aware of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I said, you know what, let me see what I can find. I knew there was nothing else out there that I can look up except, like you said, microfiche and microfilm and articles. And so the process started. I wrote to one. I had the cartoons on 16 millimeter. I, I got the credits. I wrote them down and I tried finding someone. Um, as a matter of fact, I found Chris Cuttington in Australia. He was working or, or in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, and this was before the internet, so I had to go to the library and do what they have, a, a phone disc, where you had to put the disc in and look up people's names in different countries. And wow. I, I found one. He mentioned someone, Ron Campbell, uh, in Arizona, who also worked in Australia originally. Okay. I went to the phone disc, and there's like 15 Ron Campbells in, in, Cal in uh, Arizona. I called <laughs> up every one, and I finally got the right one. He's like, you really want to know about this silly cartoon? <laughs> and it snowballed. He gave me a name like the old Bella Balsam commercial and so on and so on. Mm, right. It literally snowballed where he gave me a name and then they gave me a name. And 
And soon enough, I had 85% of the participants uh, who really worked on it in, in all the countries, Australia, the UK, Canada, Holland. Okay. Uh, so it, it, that's how it really began. But it was, it took me four and a half, five and a half years to really research to get all the material. And I'm still finding out new stuff today, which is kind of cool. Right. So, you know, you get this idea to write about the book. I mean, do you, do you search for a book deal first or you're just doing this out of the love and passion for the, for the cartoons? I did it for the love and passion, but after about 150 pages, I said, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to try to find a publisher. And right. it was tough because even though the Beatles were big, huge, right. uh, people didn't know about the cartoons. And so it was tough getting a publisher. Uh, I had a bunch of big, big publishers interested, but, one of them uh, really wanted it to go over well. And um, unfortunately for the world and for me, uh, Princess Diana passed away. So my book was canceled because they had oh. a thousand books on her. Okay. Uh, so it, it was a rough process getting a publisher, but finally a small one took it on. And, and it you know what? It, it's done really, really well. And it, it's more 20 years since it's been out. And uh, it's still the only book on the show. And, right. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty proud of it. Cool. I, that's great. I mean, so um, unfortunately, it's not uh, available at the moment. Um, on the but, bootleg world, it is. Yeah, in the bootleg world, yes, 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 David. <laughs> but we're not all bootleg crazy on, like, like you are. <laughs> um, but talk about what's what's in the book. I mean, do you go um, uh, episode by episode, you know, describe? I, in the book, what I do is, first of all, I tell the whole story of how it happened. From okay. day one with Al Brodax, uh, you know, seeing someone with bad drawings of the Beatles, and then really telling the story of how a cartoon series evolves from the sponsorships to getting the network. I mean, really the whole thing to script writers and then actual, you know, I interviewed the animators who told me their process uh, and fun stories of the Beatles. And then at the end, I do have the episode guide where I go you know, each episode, there's 78 of them because there's 39 right. and a half hours. Mm. And, uh, and I, I have a picture from each episode and I talk about each one and, and who did them and, and just a little synopsis on each. Right. So, yeah, it's gotcha. fun. Cool. Yeah, I mean, David sent me, uh, uh, I think you sent me each episode. Yeah, um, yeah how did you get them, David? Uh, the Internet Worlds. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> You know, so I do have them. I, I think I probably watched like the first four. Um, so, Mitch, do you feel like Apple Core will? I mean, they love to promote it on T-shirts and and little caricature dolls. And do you ever feel like that's going to hit like the Blu-ray market as a niche release? You know, it's weird because I, I've written to them as recently as a couple of years ago and said, "What do you guys plan to do with them?" And I and I have a good relationship with Apple uh, at the moment. So it's at the moment, I say. Um, no, but it, and, they, and they wrote me back and said, we, we really don't have any plans to release them. But uh, at some point, there's going to, you know, as you said, they're, they're on T-shirts. They're, they're everywhere in terms of kids' products and stuff. Right. I, I do think at some point in the Beatles' ongoing future, at, to, to keep revenue streams going, mm -hmm. they're going to run out of stuff to release. And right. as much as the cartoons, you know, there were a bunch of the, everybody says, oh, my goodness, they were so on PC. Oh, my goodness. You know what? If you go and watch the Popeye releases. And <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my Lord. I mean, right. it's so racist and prejudiced. And, but it's a cartoon. Yes. I can. I, I'm trying to convince them that there are at least 15 to 20 out of the 78 that are so, you know, sweet and saccharine that you can easily do a best of DVD, if not the whole series. Right. So we'll see what happens. I mean, again, I know they're doing all these super deluxe edition boxes and other stuff, but at some point they're going to have to put out something different. And also in order to, you know, we're all dying out. I don't yeah. mean it now, but we're getting older and no one's going to care. And, you know, at some point, the younger crowd is going to have to know the Beatles again. And how are you going to do that? Cartoons, Cartoons. and Beatle music. Yeah. 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 You know, and it also depends on, you know, how, you know, what kind of shape are they in? How much money are they going to have to put into a restoration? I mean, all that stuff. I'm just you so know? sick well, of yellow they have all the original negatives. They, I, right. I, I helped them catalog the negatives at, at least 10 or 15 years ago. Oh. 
Um, they have them all, uh, you know, whether they're in great shape or not, I don't know, but uh, I, they, they must. They must be okay. And even if they have to do some restoration, they did the restoration for the Beatles 1 Plus. Mm-hmm. And all yep. that, so they could, do, listen, a cartoon's easier to restore than, you know, uh, than having like the Beatles on film. Right. So it, I, I think there's hope. I mean, right now there's a slim hope, but I mean, there's always hope. And I do think money talks and the other walks, you know. So uh, I do think that at some point they're going to have to release. I mean, they're releasing stuff. stuff that we've been wanting for years, you know, under Neil Aspinall. And it's amazing they release in the same year as the Pepper box set, the Flex, you know, the uh, the Flex, the Christmas Flexies on color yep. vinyl. You know, yep. who saw that one coming? I mean, so that was a nice <laughs> bonus. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, money talks, and and I don't mean it that they're just in it for the money. They're not. Those like fun, right? It's it is a business. The, the Beatles are a product now. They're not a band. Yeah. They have they're a brand. brand. They're a brand. Yep. Yeah. And guess what? When you have a brand and you have money to be made, you make money, or else right. you don't exist. It funds and, the next yeah. project. You know. Right. So. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that there's a next generation out there that want to collect Beatles stuff. And I, and I think Poison Kane is um, is this the Egypt station with all of these releases. All of them are selling. I mean, all these special editions are selling out. The suitcase pretty much sold out. You know, all the color vinyls are, you know, um, buying special. Them all, Tom. So yeah, well, of course I'm buying business. them all. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there's started, also. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm this not going to get you started, but the train point is. is not going to leave the station. Yeah. So the point is, is, is people are puns. buying them. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you said you, you you said you're still learning more about the the cartoons. Is, is this something that you would is this something you like to revisit again someday in the future? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's funny because I, I the one thing that I really want to put together uh, almost as a separate little um, addendum. I, I do talk in there about the when the Beatles first saw the cartoons on July 29, 65, the same day as they saw Help for the first time. Mm-hmm. And, and and I do, uh, you know, when I talk to everybody, everybody had some great, great, great stories about the Beatles there. I do have eight millimeter movies of them arriving at the uh, at the um, screening, uh, looking George especially pretty mad. But um, but I I found um, so many so many pictures from that day. Uh, there's a great story about how John Lennon was bored to be a Beatle. Uh, that day because he was so tired they were practicing for Blackpool Night Out which was August 1st uh, this was July 29th they were going to see these silly cartoons and then they were going to uh, see the premiere of Help mm-hmm. they were tired or knackered as they said they were exhausted and John said screw it I'm, I'm taking a bottle of wine and going under a, a buffet table because they, you know, they had some press there and, and he did it and Norman Kaufman who was uh, the youngest guy at TVC cartoons uh, in London he went with him I found, I now found pictures of John going under the table. <laughs> wow. Which were not in my book, unfortunately, because, you know, you find things out after the book is published. Right. So I'd love to have just a whole, I could easily do a, a separate, smaller book on just that day with a, a I, have, I have at least 30 or 40 pictures now from that day. Mm-hmm. Cool. Which, Did... Did the Yellow Submarine film hit you the same way as as the cartoons did? Uh, the tel- television series. No, no. When I was younger, Yellow Submarine, I didn't get it. I, I just didn't get it. I loved it. It, it was because it was the Beatles, and I'm, I'm, I, when I was younger, I loved everything that the Beatles did. Except I, I must tell you, when I flipped over uh, Let It Be in 1970 after that beautiful song and heard You Know My Name. I right. didn't get it because <laughs> <laughs> I was eight and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> right. But, um, but Yellow Submarine, it was gorgeous. It was trippy. You know, I'm not, I love it because I know the people who worked on it because most of the same people who worked on the cartoons went to work on that. Um, the only thing is, I will tell you, uh, it, it, for me, it, it's, they restored it so beautifully, right. but, but, but it still doesn't. I, I, it still doesn't resonate with me as much. It's still a little bit boring to me. Okay. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking the film. It's 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 revolutionary. It's definitely a classic. It just uh, to me, it's it it. 
I guess also because the Beatles have overhyped it so much where mm-hmm. everything is Yellow Submarine now. So it's just plugged in, oh, overexposed, commercialized, uh, right. handling with care. So <laughs> it's absolutely way overexposed. I mean, if I don't see another Yellow Submarine figurine or shirt or lunchbox for a while, uh, it, it would be too soon. Gotcha. <laughs> That's funny. Um you know, getting away from 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 the from the animated stuff, if you will. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I enjoy about uh, Fab Four Free for All is your is just the, the way you guys, you know, you Tony and, and um, Rob, um, your your chemistry. I, I I think it's fun. I mean, at times it can be a little hectic, but but you sure. guys, I mean, nothing. Ver- n- not a lot really gets over your guys' head. You know, you guys are shooting off jokes left and right, you know. Um, you know, just talk about that, you know, that, that, that chemistry and, and, you know, how you guys build on, build on that. Sure. You know, we, we love the Beatles. We're honest. We're not going to, you know, we're not on anybody's payroll, so we're not going to kiss anybody's butt. Um, but we, we are genuinely good friends. We hang out other than... You know, in the studio, uh, we, we, we literally have barbecues. We, you know, we, uh, unfortunately, we attend each other's, you know, bad things like <laughs> my mom passed and the guys were there for yeah, me every day. That's and, nice. Yeah, I mean, we, we, ge- we are genuinely friends who love the Beatles. Now, we always say that without the listeners, we could be three guys sitting in a diner talking about the Beatles in a right. booth. And, and that's what we try to come off as. We're not, you know, we've always said that we are fans. We're not experts. Yes, I wrote a book and Tony and Rob do Beatles shows. Okay, that's nice. But that and $2 is not getting us on a subway. So <laughs> we, we are fans. And the listeners, we are no better than any fan or listener out there. Our opinions don't mean any more. Um, yes, we may be knowledgeable and more knowledgeable than some and a whole lot less knowledgeable than others, believe me. Right. And we make mistakes, but we love what we do. We don't, you know, we don't make money on it. We do it for the love of the Beatles, and, and it's a labor of love, and it's just three friends who really genuinely love each other and love what we're talking about. Right. Yeah, and that's, yeah, I mean, I mean, that does come off when, when you when you listen to the show. So, I mean, it's one of the things that appreciate I appreciate, it. yeah, about it. Um, you know, what Sorry, is the future? I've been quiet on no, this. go ahead. I, I just no, bought your right. book on eBay just now. Um. <laughs> By two? <laughs> 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 Excuse me. Um, uh, you know what? What's the future look like for Fat Four Free for All? You know, it, it's been a rough couple of years. We've had, you know, as you get older, you 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 find that you can't get out and and schedule recordings a lot. Right. Um, and you know, we've had some health issues personally and family wise. And like I said, my mom just passed a, a month ago, so it's been tough. But the future is bright. We've been doing it for ten years. <clears throat> since the Fab Forum and then Fab Four Free for All, uh, you know, there's there's no stopping us as long as there's something to talk about. And Lord knows, there's always something to talk about. So right. <laughs> as long as the listeners are going to be with us and hang with us, which we have some incredible listeners, loyal, yeah. uh, we'll be mm-hmm. we'll be there. We'll be there. Cool, cool, cool. Now, um, David, um, you just bought the book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, that takes money out of my pocket. I'll tell my kids they can't have lunch oh, money. Sorry. Hold on, let me just let me just stop uh, guys. <laughs> this is I'm awkward. Just kidding. Yeah, way to go, Dave. I way had PayPal go. balance money, so <laughs> very good. You know, you could have transferred that to me. You know? no. Yeah, you couldn't send the guy a check. What the hell? Yeah, you know, I didn't know. I, didn't know, I would. Oh, right. I'll buy your <laughs> next. I'll buy your next expanded edition. Promise. Okay. <laughs> It'll be like Egypt Station. I'll just keep releasing yes, them. Thank you. That's Different you color want. covers, you know, and yes. stuff like that. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what we want these days. We well, want many editions. Um, I'm not so sure we all want that, but that's okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, like I said earlier, um, we're we're gonna have a we're gonna talk about um, some mistakes that Paul may have made or or did make in in our opinion uh, throughout his. Uh, illustrious uh, 49 year solo career um, when you have a, yeah when you when you have a career that long you I mean nobody's gonna have a perfect I, I don't know I mean Mitch do you you know somebody that's had a career as long as Paul do you think there's any musician or band out there that's had a near perfect career I think Kaja Gugu um, had a 
No, um, no, there's nobody, you know, everybody has a misstep. It's just natural yeah. right. in life. You do it. And, and, you know, 49 years is longer than a lot of people's careers. And, uh, I mean, yeah. look at the Stones. They've had missteps. Everybody's had a misstep. So, yeah. no, I mean, it's only natural that he's going to have a few and he's, he's human. So, you know, he's, he's, he's only thinking about what we may like and we're not going to like everything. So, uh, of course, there's mistakes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, steps than mistakes, but you know, we could call it whatever. I mean, any euphemism right. you want, but it, it, there, it's nothing terrible. It's just he's still an amazing person who's had an amazing career, and uh, you know, I mean, and seventy-seven almost, and, he, and you know, he's he's still doing it for better or for worse. He's still doing it, and <laughs> no, and I don't mean that negatively either. Right, uh, right. He's he's still out there, and as long as he's making people happy, then. You know, I, I hate to quote the "She loves you," but you know, you know that can't be bad. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> Anyways, so yeah, we're gonna uh, each pick um, uh, three. You know, I guess you know. So there's been a few missteps maybe throughout his career. Um, each person is gonna pick three. Uh, it's gonna relate just to the solo career. Um, it can be Beatles related as long as it happened, you know, in the solo career. Um, so. Uh, David, you want to start things off for the first round, and we'll just rotate who starts, uh, and we'll get the uh, some tomatoes ready to throw at you here in a second. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I had a feeling okay. I'd be going first. Um, uh, <laughs> mistakes, mistakes, or kind of missteps, maybe missteps. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, we'll cover, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll touch. Well, I don't want to take uh, Mitch's. Uh, I'm telling you right now, two out of two out of the three yeah, are, gonna be, yeah. are, are not ones I think you're gonna have. So okay. I mean, one I think we're all gonna have. I think all right, all right, all right. Well, let's so, just I think let's round table this one, and we sure. have an you know, I oh God, I think his over touring and lack of care of his muscle called his voice, um, and definitely the last since 2012, uh, I, I get it, he's getting older. Uh, and I know he's not doing three month tours like he did in the 2002 and 2005 tour and the Europe stuff, but just the lack of care and coaching of his vocal cords and he's shredding them. And I guess we should all be lucky. He's playing two and a half hour shows, 38 to 41 songs a set, but yeah, take a little bit more water these days, Paul, cause we want, <laughs> we want you to, you know, he, he is, he'll he always keep playing music, but I don't think he's going to have that voice much longer for right. what's left of it. Wow, yeah. David, you just went straight into the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, I, you know there, there's a lot of bands that have been going on or are artists that have been going on as long as him. And, and they're, they're slowly starting to, to call it a career. And I know – you know, me being a big Kiss fan, you know, Paul Stanley, finally, I think he's finally realizing that his vocals or his voice is, is starting to, you know, die. Um, but we'll see how long this 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 end of the road or whatever they, uh, their final tour tour lasts. But I really think that he feels that he owes it to his fans to keep doing this or or even if he just loves it that much that he just doesn't want to stop. So either way, it's it's you know some kind of ego that that's propelling him to you know to keep going. You know, I mean, do you really love it that much that you have to keep going? You know, I don't know. So, I mean, what are your thoughts, Mitch? Well, my 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 thoughts. Wow, you know, Mark Lewis in, in his book Tune In gave you a good picture of McCartney's upbringing about mm. you know you you can't McCartney never accepts no. Uh, or never is never can be told by anybody what to do. Yeah. Um, so he's his own man, for better or for worse. And you know, I have to agree with David. His voice, you know, up until about wow, uh, you know, 2009 at City Field, 2011 at Yankee Stadium was okay. Uh, after that, I mean, I saw him at the Irving Plaza show in 2014. He was still really good, but. For that night, because the next night he went on Saturday Night Live and embarrassed himself, uh, doing maybe I'm amazed. Let's let's call it spade a spade. It was really horrible. Mm -hmm. Well, but, don't give too much away because that might be somebody's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, you know, Go ahead. I'm, saying is, I, I, I'm personally I'm not going to pay two hundred and eighty dollars anymore to hear that. 
Uh, not that no. look, I understand that there's people who have never seen him. And listen, when you're in the in the live environment and you have 50,000 or 20,000 people singing with you because everybody sings with him now, mm -hmm. you don't hear it. But if you heard a line feed of yeah. just him, you would you would be amazed at, at, at how bad it is. Now, again, it's Paul McCartney. It's the excitement of seeing him. Exactly. And, and there are times when he does sound all right. I'm not saying he'll never sound like a 25 year old Paul McCartney. Never. We, I don't sound like a, you know, like me three years ago. I want him to sound like a 59 year old Paul McCartney, but I, I guess he's <laughs> 77 now. But I'm asking well, too much. Well, you know, it's it, it's weird though. I, I agree with you, David. I think he needs to do a two, couple of things. <clears throat> he needs to have a vocal coach, which I don't know if he does or not, because if he does, he should fire him. But for her. <laughs> But he should have a vocal coach. Uh, he also, yes, I know he prides himself on, I only, I never took water. I finally did the other night. Well, you know what? He, he should. He should wet his whistle a little more and, and, and also pick songs that really fit him now. I mean, yes, he can scream the rockers because no one cares because it's screaming. Right. Um, and he does, and he took yesterday out of the set. Yeah. You know, yep. yesterday is iconic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't take that out of the set, but. There are other songs he. I, I think he can learn to manipulate his voice. No, he does not have to go down keys like Ringo would. You know, got to pay your dues if you want. Right. But, <laughs> but uh, I do think he um, he does need to do a little bit with his voice, a lot with his voice, uh, because the ego is driving him. And at some point, people are going to be like, "Wow, I, I I paid a lot and I didn't right. get it." But there are so many people wearing. Beetle colored glasses that it doesn't matter. You could say to someone, Wow, didn't he sound like crap? And they'll be like, Oh my God, he was the best thing that ever happened. And that's great. Well, I don't I, mind. Yeah. As long as he's still out there, I can't knock him. So you are, you do notice that he hasn't released like a live album of like since 2009. You know, he's not, doesn't seem like he released anything on the, on the run tour or anything since 2009 or 10. I don't know. But if he it's... did the Grand Central. I mean, it is a, a, a quote, a release on iTunes, the uh, you know Grand Central Terminal. Oh, uh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. And, and under lives. the stairs at Abbey Road. Yep. But if you hear those, I have to be honest, those are horrible. Hmm. Yeah, they're fair bad. And they're just not great. Yeah. Um, Mitch, you want to give your uh, your first uh, missed up? Yes. I, um. You know what? I think it's not releasing a single from the McCartney album. Uh, okay. Did I take one of yours? Well, kind of, but go ahead. <laughs> wow, I didn't think anybody was going to say that. <laughs> you know, he didn't release Another Day until February of 71. Right. And right. McCartney was released April of 70. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he announced in, in the press that the Beatles were gone, even though John left earlier. But uh, he announced it. And people were not really loving him at the time. And so he was down a little bit in terms of people's popularity as a Beatle. And then he comes out and he puts out McCartney. Now let's face it. It's a rough album. And I was going to use that as a misstep in general, but I decided yeah. to go with the single. I, I am glad we agree about that. Well, maybe I'm amazed should have been released. I mean, I know it was released in 77, the live version, right, but right. if he would have released, maybe I'm amazed in April or May of 70, I think his career, solo career, would have gotten off to an amazing start. Yep. Um, and he could have released every night as the second single. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And then, and then it would have been totally different because he would have been on par with what he had been doing. Instead, he doesn't release anything uh, at all. The album is okay, but it was only publicized. It was only it only did really well because the Beatles just broke up, so people were clamoring for anything solo Beatles. Right. And so they bought it. So it, it did okay, number I mean, five. It went, no, I thought it, went the, day, but, I thought it was number one here. The, uh, uh, oh, no, you're, you're right, the album. But like yeah. another day later, another yeah. day when he released that, okay. in one went to number five and number two in the UK. And, and right. you know, it just wasn't, like John said, it's since you're gone, you're just another day. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the impact that I think he could have had if Maybe I'm Amazed was the first single because – that was really the song that was lauded on the album as being the powerhouse, and right. it should have been out. I, that was, I think, his... No, it's funny. Uh, too many people, that was your first mistake. <clears throat> um, I think, honestly, that was his really big mistake 
right at the beginning of a solo career. Yeah, you know, we can probably gel our number ones together here because, um, you know, you know, the, the McCartney release was was my uh, was my um, you know first uh, messed up as well. I I think feel he should have gone the the Lennon route and maybe release a couple singles first before that album because you know that album it just doesn't feel complete. I mean yeah you've got every night you got maybe I'm amazed which you know were 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 treated very very kindly on, on those albums, but you got, you know, stuff that just doesn't feel finished, you know, especially, you know, the lovely Linda, you know, I mean, the first, you know, and, um, and it's the album opener. Yeah. It's the album and, and the song, man, you know, that would be something. I mean, here you only have one verse, you know, maybe, you know, spend some time on this album, give it another verse or, or just spend, you know, or re-record the songs in the Abbey Road studio. Don't, you know, give us what you recorded at home. You know, yeah. um, so off that, the, that the Beatles were going to release Let It Be at the same time and and they were done by then. Right. And I think his ego just said, I have to yeah. now come out. And, and unfortunately, yeah. I don't think it works. Yeah. See, I, you know, and I don't have a problem with him, you know, announcing that he's leaving or the Beatles are breaking up. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have the problem with, you know, him. Uh, um, with the with the layout, if you know, because what, what Let It Be was first in uh, in uh, May, I want to say, and yeah. then or or March or something like that, and then he releases wow. um, uh, McCartney album in, in in April, and then well, what, we'll get around, yeah, yeah, and then May you've got the Long and Winding Road. Um, I you know let those let those two singles you know go out, and then just knock it out of the park maybe at the beginning of summer, maybe a June, July release of, of maybe I'm amazed. I mean, I think that would have been a great summer song. Yeah. It would have been a great opening song for his solo career instead of another song. Right. Yeah. I totally agree. And then, you know, during that time, you know, give the McCartney album a little bit more care and attention and maybe release that, you know, say early spring. You want to know my theory on that album? I, I feel like he didn't get his wish uh, or it didn't his wish it was not fulfilled on Let It Be or the Get Back sessions to something that's so like garage rock, mm-hmm. un- unembellished. You know, I think then I think what Phil Spector pissed him off. He's like, screw the guys, I'm just gonna do my own thing. <laughs> so raw, basically, I'm just plugging into the board and recording. Yeah, but. But Plastic Ono Band is raw, but it sounds like a more complete. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, this is a self-produced, you know, on his four-track stutter and right. I, I think it was a complete. Okay, I did Abbey Road. We 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 put so much polish on Let It Be that I didn't really ask for that, so I'm just gonna do right. But like you just said it though. I mean, Abbey Road. I mean, here you are. You're, you're, you just probably played Abbey Road, you know, 200 times, you know, until the release of McCartney. You're listening to McCartney. You're like, what the hell is this? I mean, what I mean, would do? Uh, well, you're probably what uh, eight when and uh, for the release of McCartney. So maybe it yeah. didn't impact you this, as much as maybe someone in their 20s. But I can imagine like, you know, so a, a, a big Beatles fan, you know, hearing the McCartney album. They're like, what the hell is this? He just gave us this you know, this lavish production or, or helped with it on Abbey road. And, you know, here we get in this you know, <laughs> garage band type feel of an album. That might've been his therapy just to go completely yeah, 180 it. from what people think he is or what he was. Right. And you should have kept it in the can for later. Seriously. Yeah. I think, yeah. and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to use the word half baked because he's, he's always fully baked. <laughs> but, but no, I'm, come on. But yeah. um, I, I think if he would have just flushed out the songs a little more, and you know, we get mm-hmm. we get some instrumentals. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, it's, just, it's it's just not. It may have been therapy for him, but the, I think his ego told him to release it. Yeah. And I think if he would have held on to it and polished it up a little more and yeah. gave the songs some more lyrics, and I think it would have been a better album. That's all. Ram could have yeah, been a I double mean, album. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you guys discussed this uh, album yet on uh, Fab Four. I would really love to see you guys touch There's on this so album. We haven't. It's it's you yeah. know you can only do so many that and yeah, Paul exactly. has you know Paul has a hundred and two albums. So you know, oh, you know. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, all right, well, Mitch, why don't you start us off for for round two? Okay, I'm not going to go obvious here, so I'm going to okay. bring it back to a little bit where. Um, when David was talking about too much touring now, well, from 79 to 88, 
um, or 80 to 88, no touring. Mm -hmm. And I I think that hurt him. I really do. And I'll tell you why. Um, Because he put out some albums. Obviously, Tug of War was amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of my favorites. And, um, but he also put out, you know, Pipes of Peace, Press to Play, and then All the Best, and the soundtrack to Broad Street. It wasn't a very prolific time for him, even though I love Press to Play, but Paul hates it for some reason. But I do think that if he it didn't sell. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it went gold, which is nothing yeah. for him, Barney, but Right. But, but go ahead, if, sorry. No, that's all right. If, if he would have toured a little, I think he would have kept himself more, number one, vocally in shape, because when he first came out in 89... Uh, in the first hit leg of that tour, his voice was pretty raw. Uh, so I think he would have kept his voice in shape. I think we would have maybe had a full set at Live Aid mm-hmm. if he would have uh, had a band and, and had been touring, um, which I think would have been phenomenal because everybody went nuts when he came out to do Let It Be, and unfortunately the microphone went nuts too. But right. um, But also he was doing a lot of TV, especially when All the Best came out, Live stuff. I mean, right, incredible yeah. stuff on Vogan, you know, where he's doing mm-hmm. Listen to What the Man Said and, yep. and uh, Only Love Remains. He played at the Royal Command performance and on live TV. Uh, so he was doing some great TV work, but right. but he didn't do anything touring wise. And I think the public, after the albums that he had put out, and especially when he joined together with Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder, I think the public sort of put him out of their minds for a long time after press after a tug of war. So I think if he would have toured prior to the 89 tour, I think uh, it would have been a better, a better thing for his career. Right. And I think there was some chatter um, of him possibly putting a band together the tour. Um, I think we, you know, I would have loved to see that, that the lineup of, um, and give my regards to Broad Street, the film, the lineup that does not such a bad boy, and uh, yeah. no values, you know, with Dave yeah, Edmund Ringo on drums, but Steve yeah. Gadd would have been great. Yeah, yeah, right. You didn't need Ringo on drums because I'm sure that was yeah. still his dark, drunk period. Um, yeah. But um, that that lineup, I thought, you know, was great. You know, and you know, maybe throwing an Eric Stewart in there as well. Um, yeah. But I, I, I think that would have been, you know, cool. I'm yeah. Really- I would if he would have done a Live Aid set that was a full McCartney set. When, when I say full, you know, five songs, four songs like Queen did. Mm-hmm. Right. I think it would have even overshadowed Queen. And mm-hmm. I and I and I I'm not a big Queen fan, but I love their set and I love because if you really look at Live Aid itself, Queen was the only thing that was any good that day. <laughs> I mean, okay. a, lot of, a lot of the bands were just horrible. I mean, Led Zeppelin was horrible. Everybody, you know, nobody was great. Um, and mm-hmm. if McCartney had his vocal chops, especially at that time, and oh, yeah. had a band together and put five songs, I think he would have been the hit of Live Aid. So I think we all suffer for that, and I think he suffered. Um, and I, and you know, he did the Princess Trust, and he yeah, was really I was good. Say, yeah, because he only did what two songs on. For, he only did two songs for for that as well. I, I believe. Well, he did the, yeah, Get Back, and I saw her standing, standing there. Standing right. Mm-hmm. And right. one of them was with Tina Turner. So right. I mean which is not a complaint at all. I loved it. But uh, I think if he would have toured, it would have kept him in the public eye a lot more and maybe actually had better album sales because of it. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's a good one. Yeah. Um, mine is uh, my s- number two takes place during the eighties as well. Um, uh, that was be January 20th, 1988. Um, not showing up at the rock and roll hall of fame. Mm-hmm. I think that was oh. a misstep. Wow. Uh, that's a good one, Tom. Yeah. Um, you know, his his statement, you know, is, is kind of weird or kind of funny. You know, after 20 years, the Beatles still have some business, uh, some business differences, which I had hoped would have been settled by now. Unfortunately, they haven't been. So I would feel like a complete hypocrite waving and smiling with them at a fake reunion. Well, going up there and accepting a award, I really don't consider that a reunion unless you're playing live music um so he could have done something like a john fogarty or steve perry before they did that which is show up but not perform you know because you know fogarty refused to play with his ex-bandmates and and steve perry didn't you know and it really just bothers me you know i was i was so happy when chicago got in the rock and roll hall of fame and it and it really bothered me that that um peter satara didn't show up 
you know, yeah. he didn't have to perform, but but show up, you know. He, he was he was the voice of Chicago, you know, even though he wasn't the leader, like you know, like like Terry Kath was, but he was the voice of Chicago, and um, it really was a was a was a uh, was I think a misstep on on his uh, on his. Uh, but you, but... you know, I agree, and and if you're gonna do it the right way, <clears throat> you're gonna do it like Steve Perry. Perry <laughs> even even applauded <clears throat> Arnell, the new singer, right, uh, and, and that was amazing. Um, it was sad seeing George up there with Ringo and Yoko and Sean and right. Julian. Julian. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, look, John couldn't be there uh, for obvious reasons, but you know, Paul should have put aside his ego because that's all it was. <clears throat> I mean, if anybody wouldn't have been there, I would have thought George wouldn't have showed up. But but George went and had the great line about you know Paul's got the speech. Um, but <laughs> I, I really do. I, I agree. You know, th at that time they weren't doing sets like uh, like they do now. It's not mm -hmm. like you know where they go and do five songs. They were just doing or the all star jams. So mm -hmm. Paul could have easily either skipped the jam or he could have easily joined in on the jam and just stayed on the other side of the stage from George and Ringo if he felt that strongly about it. Right. But he should have showed up. It yep. was. It's the Beatles, and I know we're <laughs> – yes, there's other bands that are really big, but the Beatles are the Beatles. Let's yep. face it. And when the Beatles got in, everybody was looking forward to it, and he should have been there. It's a, that's a great one, Tom. Yeah, yeah but then you, you would have missed yeah. all that Mike Love call-out speech. <laughs> oh, my Lord. You're going to get me started on that? <laughs> hey, he really had a field day with that, man. He really just – Went for it. I know. I mean, well, I don't know. The missteps, I would have to say, Mr. and Mrs. Love having sex yeah. that night. <laughs> because, and, and having Mike Love, because Lord knows he's been such a bastard over the years. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so David, a little bit of that TM. <laughs> David, you want to hit us with your uh, number two? Yeah. I guess I'll bring yeah. it up. <laughs> You're going to go there again for another one, aren't I'm you? I'm always going there, man. <laughs> go ahead. We it's don't have fun. sponsorships. Um, we're not getting paid. Um, <laughs> Heather Mills McCartney. Oh, you did it! I you did. did it. <laughs> it's so funny because I have to just say one funny thing. I, I was telling Tony that I'm going to be on, and I said, "Here's my mistakes." And Tony said, "You're not going to mention that one-legged stump bitch." Like, whoa, 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 whoa! I said, "I." I can't do that. He says, yes, you can. I said, I'm not. And you did it. I love it. I love it. I get Paul, even though he has a huge ego, he has a huge heart, and he had to have it fulfilled after Linda passed, and I get it. And they hit it off really nice with the charity stuff. Something yeah. turned once he got her engaged, and she – even I've read stories previous to that, like in the Cavern Club – I, I think people got a feeling that Paul was changing because of this woman. And uh, I don't think it was, an, obviously it wasn't in a good way. And uh, I guess we have some of those friends that kind of change once they get married or have a girlfriend. And I think that's what happened to him. And I know this is his personal life and it shouldn't matter on his professional career. But, mm. it I mean, people don't really care for the driving rain era because it kind of clouts it with the uh, Heather Please Mills. Don't get me Started. Don't get me started. I'm driving rain. <laughs> I'm gonna fly to the moon. So maybe that should have been driving rain. Maybe I'm getting it. driving rain. So you should have oh, just called on, it Heather. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm telling you, don't do it because you'll get me started. Right. And, and I, I don't want to solve the world by saying that driving rain is bleh. But anyway. Uh, Anyways. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, there. I think. Initially, he yes, he, he had a it was a rebound relationship, and and I'm not going to talk to it you know that much because uh, no one knows what Paul was thinking in his heart and his head, right. uh, whichever head that was. Um, you know what? He, he found someone uh, that was into charity, mm -hmm. which is very admirable. You know, she had a lot of charity work, which is great, and I'm not going to ever knock her for that. She got she the big amazing. charity at the end. <laughs> yes, forty eight million. Yeah, but you know what? I think he needs. Oh no, a actually, the it pre was a rebound relationship. Yeah, and uh, and he needed it. And um, okay. I got to yeah. tell you guys, if you look at the porno magazine she was in, the German <laughs> magazine, she didn't look too bad. She was pretty hot. 
Uh, oh, you know, I should have said the prenup. That was the mistake, not the mar- not the marriage, the freaking prenup. He didn't do one, so maybe that's why he's killing yeah. his voice touring until twenty thirty. Um, and he got a daughter out of it. I you know. So I think forty eight million to him was worth one point two billion. Yeah. A, it, thank goodness he had good lawyers. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure she was. You know, riding to Vanity Fair. I mean, go go. You know, listen to that again and tell me he was still in love with her. He wasn't. Um, right. But and, and I, again, I think it was a dark period in his life. Um, and I, I think to your point, it affected him mentally. Um, I don't you know, after driving rain, he didn't put anything out to what chaos in 2005. Yeah. So but he so, was recording in 2003, 2004, yeah, yeah. you know, a couple albums. Yeah, but, you know, I think it was a point where, he, you know, look, he has a beautiful daughter because of that, so we can't argue there, yeah. uh, which he loves dearly. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do agree with you. I think he changed a little bit. Uh, I think she ended up sort of, in my own opinion, it's not fact, I think she used him uh, for the charity. Uh, and when she hooked him, I think she really had no intention of, of keeping him, so to speak. Um, and I, I think there was some preconceived stuff going on, but that's a, a tale for a different day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it you know, it, like the McCartney album, it was probably rushed. Um, you know, like you say, it's probably in a dark place, you know. So, you know, and didn't you say, um, I mean, his kids did kind of warn him about her as well, um, yeah. I, I believe. So, but, you know, love is blind, you know, so it's, sure. you know, it's unfortunate. But, um so that was the number twos, right? Yeah. All right. I'll Boy, she was the number two. Yeah, she was the number two. <laughs> You're on the same page there, David. Oh, man. Um, I guess I'll kick off the uh, kick off number three. Oh, come um, on. It's so obvious. We all have to pick this one. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Well, you, know you mentioned, yeah, I mean, you mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier, um, you know, February 15th, 2015. Um oh. You know, the guy just did a, a 28 set song uh, song set list the night before, and uh, you know we already know he's having troubles, uh, you know, live uh, vocally at at this point in time. But then you know the big a big event, 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live, and you know, and then back to maybe I'm amazed. You know, it's wasn't really a good idea. I mean, who knows? Maybe he sounded fine during set during a uh, sound check and uh, you know, and it gave him the confidence to continue with it. But um, wow. you know, there was a couple, you know, there's a couple songs he didn't do the night before that I thought would have been great. Like, you know, Live and Let Die or even Birthday because it was, you know, kind of Saturday Night Live's birthday in a way, you know. So um, but you know, that would have in, involved the band, you know, so I pretty much it was just him, wasn't it, uh, on stage? Yeah, on, on with piano. I mean, no, the band yeah. was there too, but, it, you know, it's funny. I was at the show the night before. He sounded okay. okay. Again, 1,800 people, rather. Uh, he sounded good because we were all excited to be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have the DVD. He didn't sound as good as I thought, but it wasn't bad. It, 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 you know, let's give him credit. He... He still did a 90-minute show for us, and, and he sounded good. I heard that Lorne Michaels asked him to do Maybe I'm Amazed because it was a favorite okay. of his. Okay. So that might explain it, but um, there's – listen, we, we, even now when he does Maybe I'm Amazed, even in 89 when he did Maybe I'm Amazed, it was rough. Mm-hmm. It's a tough song to sing. Give, give the guy his credit. It's a tough song to sing, but it, for the 40th anniversary, he could have done – any other song, any, I right. mean, you know, he could have done help the skelter if he wanted yeah. Um, yeah. or, and, and, and you know what? I, I think it would have been better, but he did that song. We all sat around cause we were so excited from the night before and my kids sat with me and they, and he started and it was, it we just all just, the, yeah. Wow. From the first note, it was just, <laughs> well, it was, it was downhill. Now maybe his yeah. voice was shot from the night before. Yeah, exactly. But, and because that's, you notice now he spreads his concerts out like three days. Right, right. I mean, David did get to see the back-to-back shows in Detroit. What was that two years ago, David? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was like cringing knowing that you were going to see that second show. It wasn't as bad. I, I was, cr- I was, I was kind of holding my breath for maybe I'm amazed, and, and it wasn't that bad. Um, mm. But so. that's because Abe is backing him up in a live setting. 
Mm. But if you you if you're in a small intimate setting, that's why when people suggest that he does goes back to his roots and does these clubs and no, I don't want to hear him acoustically. I don't want. I mean, I, I love the guy, I really do, and I and it pains me to hear it, but I, I do want him well, to stay in the live environment so people can still enjoy it. I mean, but I don't want to go back to clubs. He right. sang the first line by himself, and it, you know, I say good and in terms of, i think i give him benefit more benefit of the doubt than it wasn't like so struggling that it was cringy like saturday night live was so right like i guess right. i lowered my expectations of what good is for that song i guess right i guess we'll have to now but mm-hmm. oh but mm. yeah but the whole band now i mean they've always been great singers you could watch the 0205 dvds but now they're all piping in louder you know, Paul's well, just blending it. Yeah. Is that a band or a backup band? Uh, <laughs> uh, here we go. Could they be in the whole team? No, they're. they're... No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> Anyways, Dave does David. more singing than Paul. Why not? <laughs> Excuse me. Oh man, David, you want to give us your uh, your number three? <laughs> oh, I guess Come I'll on, just. David. You gotta say it. <laughs> no. So um. Well, maybe we'll leave it for you. I don't know. Okay, I mean, leave it for me. I'll leave right. it for you. Um, I'm just going to go with his ego is so big these days. Or he, all right, I'll start the saying. He wants to be so relevant these days. He will try new things, new collaborations with hot young producers or musicians. But he's been doing that for years. Yeah, man. But when you're, but the age gap is not like 50 years now. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I will say this, David. I think I, I have to disagree with you there. I really do. Um, relevant, I don't think it's his ego. I think he, he likes, genuinely loves to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know I know you're probably talking about the uh, Rihanna and, and mm-hmm. Kanye. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that that's the first part of it, yeah. Well, and that's, you know what, though? So, he can he can now say he has a number one song with four or five seconds, and he plays four or five seconds in concert. No, not uh, anymore, but he did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, but he did a rock and roll version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, listen, like Tom said, he's been doing it for years. I don't think it matters the age difference. I think it, it matters. People want to work with him no matter what because he does have a lot to give. Uh, musically, he's a genius. I mean, I yeah. there's no one better than Paul McCartney. I, I, I honestly say, musically... He is just, and lyrically he's lazy, but musically he can write a, a tune that is so catchy mm-hmm. in two seconds, and it's still at 77. He, I mean, Egypt Station, as much as I don't love it, I do like it, I don't love it, but mm-hmm. there are a lot of catchy stuff on there yeah. where you're singing I, whether you like it or not. So Yeah, and, and say what you will about For You, I, I think it's very catchy. You know? It is. It is. It's 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 stupid but um no 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 uh, uh, yeah but, i guess so uh, part of your david you listen, said that was the part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but go ahead yeah go ahead, david. It, oh i know uh <laughs> go ahead i like a whole bunch of music and i and it just kind of like uh, i just feel like it's trying to pull the i don't know the card of i'm trying to do something so hip of today's music the contemporary oh um get enough got kind of just put me over the edge in terms of yeah the second half of the song's great but there what are did? get enough oh lord yeah um and and i've looked into this song and i've looked deeper than it's just ryan tedder there is another writer on this album and he's in his 20s on that song mm-hmm. and it's like kermit the frog? huh kermit the frog <laughs> <laughs> No, there's there's three writers on that song, and I know those other two wrote the first like thirty seconds or or produced that first. Oh, I get it. Beatles, the Beatles did the auto, artificial double tracking, but they invented that. You know, their engineer. Yeah. You know, they they create. And this is just hopping on a fad that just is so. You just rubber stamp 2018 right there on that song, and that's fine. He's got so many other songs, but it just. Oh, I don't know. It bothers me as a musician or as someone that like. You know, Paul could do whatever the hell he's want. He's a billionaire. He's, I'm, I'm just some dude in my own basement, <laughs> recording a podcast. So. Well, well, right now, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I buy mostly everything by him, so I, I can be like critical or cynical, and, and yeah, obviously that's my opinion, and that's what's the point of the show is. But oh, it rubs me wrong. It rubs me 
weird, you know. So I say, you know, I like 85% of Egypt Station, but then there's like a couple songs that just kind of like, I can't, I got, I've never, well, I don't know. I wasn't a big fan of Vanilla uh, Sky, but I kind of like it now compared to some of these songs I've been hearing. But um, yeah, that's. A, I love the auto tune on Get Enough. I just think that it's, it's the worst piece of crap he's done in a long time, and I'm being honest. And I mean, I like early days, you know, it sh- shows his true aging 72 year voice, two year old voice at the time. Like, keep it if you want to play like maybe I'm amazed. Keep it real on the album, too. I mean, if I'm going to hear an 80 year old Paul McCartney, I want it. I don't I, I don't I don't want it processed because that's not what you know, it's kind of like with Ozzy Osbourne. Ozzy was never a great singer. He had his own kind of tone and voice, but. There are some albums where they just put like so many effects on it. I'm like, what's the point? It might just have a, a computer just talking the lyrics, but uh, it's just oh, it's overproduction of some of his stuff lately, and just well, again, that that's been it. going on for years. Oh, too. <laughs> oh wait, he owns it in a live setting. Why don't you own it on yeah. an album? I mean, okay, right. So fair enough. Yeah, I know agree with the first part uh, because I do think that he. He is still relevant. Uh, whether we like it or not, Egypt Station went to number one. And I know that's because there's 85 versions of the album. <laughs> the so, you know, the green, the blue, the yellow, the uh, whatever, suitcases, non-suitcases, the cassette. The ticket f- sales, f- ticket sales. But I, I just feel like he's f- trying so hard. He doesn't need to prove himself that he's Paul McCartney. I'm like, yeah, you don't need to. A- but I think you're wrong there. I think he, he does want to stay relevant in, re- in regard to, like, a number one album. Now, it went from number one to number, you know, seventy, and then off yeah. the coast in three weeks. But, but you know what? And, and number ones don't are not like when the Beatles anthology and mm-hmm. Adele. They're not selling a million in or, one week. Yeah, yeah, a million or three million, like Adele. You know, it sold a hundred and seventy thousand copies or whatever, one hundred fifty six thousand, whatever yeah. it was. It went mm-hmm. to number one, which is nothing nowadays. I mean. That yeah, was somebody's. Cool. That was like the hair metal band's fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh weeks was over yeah. like over a hundred thousand. You know, but back the in the eighties. Whole has changed, Tom. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, absolutely. There's no more like physical. And so you know what? I I think he likes to to say I had a number one at the age of blah blah blah. I had a number one, and that's good on him. I I honestly, I I really, I love that. But um, but yeah, when you when you hear. Like get enough, and it wasn't on the album, so that's good. Uh, but when you hear the the auto tune, I, yeah. I, I fifteen seconds in, no. thank you very much. I'm yeah, done. That's what I did on New Year's <laughs> Day. I'm like, nope. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for it because it was like, oh, New Year's Day, you got a new Paul McCartney. Oh God, no. <laughs> Happy New Year to me. Uh, um, yeah. I do I was appreciate. Still over, I thought, but you know, I do appreciate his willingness to be. <sighs> Uh, critical. He wants to achieve something, even though he's achieved everything at seventy-seven. So I appreciate him as a musician trying to reach for something he isn't so used to, and that's a challenge, I guess, in his mind. Um, I think we, as we said earlier, he he really does love what he does, mm-hmm. and and for that you have to applaud the man. He really loves being a musician. Whether he puts out good stuff or not is neither here nor there anymore because he is Paul McCartney, and you know what. He's earned the right to, to be Paul McCartney, well, eh, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I bring up like Jimmy Page as an example. The guy doesn't have to do anything for the rest of his career, but he kind of – he had Page Plant back in the 90s, and then he's kind of been just doing the reissues. He, right. could, he could have been a Jimmy Page where he just kind of, you know, fell back onto his reputation and he's done what he needed. But, you know, can you imagine Elvis? Because he's only f- seven years older than Paul – touring if he had survived you know just seven eight years ago i mean that, that to me no. you know it's crazy to think that yeah i mean you you said you said something that uh that caught my attention mitch was you know he's earned the right you know to be paul mccartney i mean he's earned the right to pretty much do whatever he wants i think and you know my favorite actor is robert de niro you know i, I think from from 73 to like 97 he's had the greatest run and that but that's just my opinion so sure. You know, now he starts doing, you know, what he wants to do, like these, you know, a lot of them are, are stupid comedies or, you know, or right. stupid, you know, uh, or, you know, romantic comedies or whatever, rom-coms or what you want to hey, call I them. I like but, Meet the Fuckers. Yeah. What the? You hey, know. well, you know what? So do I. But you know what? But he's, he's, that's the direction he wants to go into. I mean, yeah. and I think he's earned the right to, the right to do that. Uh, Mitch, you want to give us uh, number three? 
I cannot believe nobody brought up Broad Street. Come on. <laughs> Come on. It's just so obvious. But in my honor, there, there, there is a part of Broad Street that's in my honorable mention. So let's see if you yeah. bring it up. Okay. Broad Street. Oh, do I need even to say any more? I should just go <laughs> for you. Um, yeah. uh, no, drop, like, like a, a drop. Total, an ego trip. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to get back to films like, you know, the success of the Beatles. And wow. I mean, Roger Ebert, who loved the hard days night calls is one of his favorite movies of all time said, this is about as close as you can get to a non movie. <laughs> uh, but, but he did say the music the was wonderful. Right. Just was wonderful. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a bad move on his part. I mean, yes, we got a great soundtrack. Uh, and we, we, um, you know, the little music videos, we got No More Lonely Nights, we got everything from, uh, I mean, everything is on there is really, really good. Even Eleanor's Dream, the 10 minutes is, is, is spectacular to me. Right. Um, even the Beatles stuff, you know, was it necessary? No, but it still sounds okay, because obviously he was still in great voice. Um, so the, yes, the music is absolutely wonderful, as Paul's music usually is, but yeah. the movie is just atrocious. And, and his pan you know, universally and and deservedly so. Right. Yeah. Um, he definitely should have taken some advice from the, the advice that Harrison gave him and just, you know, don't do everything, you know. I mean, Harrison at this point had, what, like six years now in, in you know, experience in, in movie making. So he had, you know, some knowledge that he could have given, you know, Paul. Uh, you know, he definitely should have taken the advice of Harrison by saying, you know, don't don't do everything. You know, it's um, because at this point, I think Harrison had what about six years experience of filmmaking with his handmade films. Um, yeah. You know, so. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's part that was one of my honorable mentions was um, redoing the Beatle classics. I, I just feel no matter he's yeah, he's still in fine voice, but. I don't think it brought anything to those songs and don't get, you know, especially, you know, one of the fav one of my favorite things about eighties music or eighties music is the saxophone solos that you hear in so many great eighties songs. Sure. And then he puts a very bad saxophone in my opinion on, you know, long and winding road. I think it's just, no. it, See, I, I have to disagree with you. I That's fine. That's I fine. Love it. I, just... I actually love that version. Yeah, okay. Fair enough, but I, I just don't think it brings anything, you know, special to the song. So he was also, you know, we're talking now. He's forty-two years old, right? And and he's in a movie that is just so ridiculous. The plot was just nothing. I mean, the tapes are stolen. Oh my God, the right. the going to go out of business if we don't get these tapes. And <laughs> then and then they follow him a day in the life of Paul McCartney, which I don't understand. Uh, but again, I don't understand what he did with, you know, the Get Back film, too, in 89. I mean, there's a lot of uh, that would may have been another misstep. I, that is my own mm. But okay. um, but uh, as far as Broad Street, I just don't I don't get where his head was at, except uh, it was just all ego. I just don't understand why he felt the need to waste money. Uh, mm. If he wanted to, he could have easily done like redos of Silly Love Songs, which I think is really cool. That one, the video and. Uh, mm. But this one, the the whole thing was just reeks of ego. Right. Yeah. No. I yeah. I agree. I I definitely agree. Uh, you want to add anything to that, David? No. I mean, I bought that DVD. It came out in two thousand four, and it was already in the shops for like five dollars in two thousand four. And <laughs> the only, the last time I watched it was when we did our kind of mystery science three thousand thing last year. So right. it's a good hangout movie. Mm. We had a couple beers with it, but. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a free. Is it really? Movie. I think I would have belched up my beer after watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but but like you said, I mean the the music aspect of it, you know, yeah. I, is, is 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 it's almost like Magical Mystery Tour in a way where you're only watching it for the you know the in movie videos, you yeah, know, but really. If you don't have cool spaghetti. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, so um yeah, so uh, so you, what was your what did you say you had an honorable mention for the get back? Um well, DVD? Yeah, the honorable mention of missteps. That that film, uh first of all, I saw it in a the theater with Paul uh in New York. I was sitting a row behind him, uh or a row in front of him, I don't remember. Um mm. and I I, I, I felt 
bad because he didn't sound great in the movie. It was edited horribly by Richard Lester. Mm. Um, and it was just a, a weird experience. The songs were slower, I thought. Um, mm. And it was, a, it was a weird concert film. And I, I thank God I went with someone really hot who I never saw again. But, um, <laughs> but that was the only saving grace for that day. But uh, on, and honestly, that was a misstep for me. It's not a huge misstep because it's still Paul McCartney in concert and in 1989, so 90 or 90, whatever. But uh, so it's not a huge misstep, but it is a little bit of an honorable mention. Right. Uh, David, you have a little honorable mention you want to mention? Yeah, every re-release of Egypt Station. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious. Uh, <laughs> that stinks. <laughs> well, I guess I guess the misstep in that was they didn't include the Explorers Edition in your super deluxe yeah. edition. So, right. okay. yeah. Um, all right, I'll, I admit, I'll do something I admitted a little bit more. that. Yeah. Uh, I guess kisses I on the crap that I could give you. Yeah. <laughs> kisses on the bottom. Uh, I, I mean, he was just trying to. I don't know. I, I I have it, but I think I played it last time, like the week of 2012 when I bought it. It just. I don't know. Mm-hmm doesn't do anything for me well i mean the problem with that was you know rod stewart had to do 20 before uh paul had the you know the nerve to do one yeah. you know i will say one thing about that and um, uh you know my mom rest in peace she listened to that album because it was on npr a lot right it really was they played well, they played the crap out of it on on npr and she loved it because my mom a, a, was a huge sinatra fan and so she would listen to uh kisses on the bottom a lot because it it you know it really rang true to to her generation and that's right. what he was speaking to so i'm not going to kill him for that because um i you know it didn't sell really well but uh it was still a good thing for uh, him generally generationally i think he got older people more involved in his music uh, and my mom went to see him at city field and stuff so she mm-hmm. loved him again from the beginning but um, I, I don't know if that's as much as a misstep as, I mean, I, I probably, I don't, that's not a go-to album for me, but, um, but I think in his career, it, it wasn't terrible. Everybody was doing it. Uh, he decided to do it. I don't think he did it as well as Rod Stewart, um, but I still think he was okay with it. So it's, it, to me, that it, it's sort of like a non-album. Uh, it, it's okay. It's, it's not one I pull out at all. Right. So you mentioned Frank, excuse me, you mentioned Frank Sinatra. How do you yep. think a Frank Sinatra version of Suicide would have sounded? <laughs> I think it would have been interesting. But the one thing I will say is that, and I think McCartney has missed the boat on this already, but I think if he would have done a duets album, mm. uh, I think that he would have, it would have been huge. Huge. I really do. Before Frank or after Frank? Either way. It didn't yeah. matter. I think, it, you know, you're still talking about Paul McCartney. You could have had 12 people work who would give, you know, their left arm to be on a duet album with Paul McCartney. Um, right. And I think, you know, I think that would have been really a good move for him, but it never happened. Gotcha. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're going pretty good here. I know we're uh, um, getting a little long in the tooth here, but uh, there's, there's a question I like to ask a lot of my guests who, um, are very experienced in the solo careers, uh, wow. especially the first uh, five years of yep. John and Paul's solo career. And uh, my question to you is this, whose career missed who more, who's more? Do you think John's missed her solo career missed Paul more or, or vice versa? Oh, that's a tough one. And you know why I really, and I know it's a cop out answer. They missed each other horribly. And I'll tell you why. They, I, I think it's equal. I really do. Okay. Because Yes, I mean, one of my favorite songs in the whole world is Instant Karma. So don't, you know, don't right. get me wrong on that. And there's, there's parts of both of their careers in those five, first five years, which are amazing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think if the Beatles were together or, you know, even if the Beatles stayed together and then decided to do solo projects, there's no way in hell Paul would have let John do sometime in New York City. <laughs> no matter how engaged he was in politics, I don't I think it would have been a softer uh, album instead of such a political mess. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, I don't think John would have let Paul put out McCartney. I think he would have said, listen, come on, yeah. we could do better than that. I right. think we both missed each other a lot. Um, 
production wise, I think uh, they missed each other. I think, you know, with Ram, I think he could have used uh, John a lot to just give a little bit of harder edge. That's a great, I love the album, but I, I do think if they were together, um, someone, you know, it would have, they, they just, both of them needed each other. They And, and it showed throughout their solo careers, but um, yeah. I, I really do think in those first five years, they, they'll never, you know, they would never have admitted it, but I think both of them really needed each other. Gotcha. All right, that's fair. I mean, you're the, I think you're the third person that said, uh, said that. So, oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, minority, you know? <laughs> right. I, 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 I think, uh, John needing Paul is, is in the leads, uh, still though. Um, I'll have to go back and check that, but, um, well, anyways, um, well, this has been, this has been a lot of fun, Mitch. I really want to thank you for joining us. Um, do you have anything? Blast. I'm so yeah. happy you asked me. I really am. Cool. Um, uh, yeah. Um, do you have any, do you, do you have anything to plug or what, anything coming up with uh, Fab Four uh, no. that you want uh, to plug or any appearances coming up? No, you know what? Um, just keep enjoying Beatle music. Keep enjoying all the shows, you know, whether it's your show or Talk More Talk or Fab Four Free For All, any, any show that promotes the Beatles or solo Beatles is okay in my book. There's a lot of us out there now. So, you know, Buskin and Rodriguez and mm-hmm. this, and everybody. It doesn't matter as long as you're enjoying what you're hearing and as long as we're doing it in a, in a, as a labor of love or for money, um, which most <laughs> of us are not. But you know what? as long as you're enjoying every show, uh, whether you like what all of us say or not, then that's all that matters because we're all – all of us um, are, are podcasters and we're all um, adding to you know keeping the Beatles and solo Beatles alive, so to speak. Right. And that's all yeah. that matters. Yeah, well said. I mean, I, I think there's plenty of room for all of us. I mean, and, and and I think we all should support each other, you know, even if, you know, there are like, uh, you know, 20 podcasts or, or what. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter. I mean, there's plenty to talk about and there's plenty to learn. I mean, we're still learning stuff. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, if there was no more to learn, I'm sure part, volume two of Tune In would be out by now. You know? <laughs> oh. Anyways. I think it's going to be too old to read by the time it does come out. It's going to be an audio book <laughs> or audio <laughs> digital file. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, I can't wait for it, by the way. It's, it's, oh, yeah. I have to just plug one thing. Mark's book, this second one, whenever it comes out, and he always says it'll be done when it's done, I can't wait because it's going to be – I mean, I know how much he researches. He's told me. He showed yeah. me. He's amazing. And when it does come out, all the bitching and moaning about, you know, 13 years or 10 years or seven years, whatever it is, yeah. it's going to be amazing. So that's Yeah, it'll it. be worth it. For oh, sure. yeah. And, yeah. You, know, you know, speaking, you know, since you are, you know, writer, if you don't mind me asking, uh, you yeah. know, I mean, is there any books in the last, you know, 10, 15 years besides Tune In that you have enjoyed? Wow, that's a good question. Um, you know what? I really, I, I'm not that I'm plugging... But Terry Crane's latest book, and it's not a, it, it's a, you know, it's more of the memorabilia, mm-hmm. uh, that one that just came out on the NEM stuff. Okay, that, yeah, that's yeah. Amazing. I mean, book wise, in terms of stories, you know, unfortunately, when you when you put out something like Tune In, it's it's the top of the heap. So you don't, you know, you don't look to any other books for history. Right. Uh, there are some entertaining books like the Larry Kane. They're mm-hmm. entertaining, uh, and and others that I'm missing. Um, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. Get, I mean, the- but yeah. there, there is a bunch, but I, I don't, I don't have time to read them all. That's the problem. Yeah, it is tough. I mean, I'm looking at a, like you know, four shelves full of books right now that I'm still trying to get to. You know, exactly. it's, uh, you know, we're David and I are really big into these uh, these A A is for Apple uh, series. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that. Sure, yeah. um, and these and these books are massive. They're like 700 pages. And, exactly. You know, and uh, I'll tell you what, the one that I have really enjoyed over the last 15 years or so is uh, the book uh, The Beetle That Vanished by uh, Jim. Um, oh yeah. Uh, Birkenstatt. Absolutely. Yeah, rock and roll detective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I found yeah, that to be... that's also, there you go. That's sort of like Beetle Tunes, and I don't mean it to, to in yeah. that regard, but but it's something that no one's ever, you know, Jimmy Nickel was such a a, a a mystery figure, right? And you know what? So I applaud him because he really dug deep into what happened and, and where you know where is he now and what's going on and, right. and so I, I like stuff like that that we when we learn something about the Beatles that we've never learned before or something new, like tune in had a ton of it. But oh, yeah. that I enjoy. I really do enjoy any book that will shed light on something that we just haven't had any light shed on before. Right. 
Cool. Well, um, that's great. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said earlier, this is our season finale of, of Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast. However, you know, if, if we're lucky or if David, you know, is up for it, we might be, we might do a bonus episode where I review the uh, June 26 uh, Phoenix show, Paul McCartney. Um, David, uh, you know, what do you think about that? Is there yeah, something? Yeah, that's gonna be another edition of Jump Station. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or anyway. it's a very short show, you know. Right? Yeah. Anyway, sure, we'll we'll tune in for that. Well, that'll we'll... be just 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 be a, a quick yeah. bonus episode. I, you I, know. Mean, I did the Detroit show a couple years yeah. ago, so yeah, it'd, it'd, that's it'd, right. It'd be your first show in about almost five years, so yeah, exactly. Because I haven't seen it since fourteen, so but. Um, but anyway, so that's a wrap for this season. I want to thank Mitch Axelrod once again. I want to thank me, Mr. Mayo. I want to thank Sam Wiles, Jeff Cummins, Alan Cozen, Ed Chen, and Lonnie Pena for joining us this season. Next season, again, we're looking uh, we're looking to have you know you know more more guests, uh, more great topics, and more and more more and more Egypt Station. Why not? Uh, <laughs> we'll be in Egypt Station all next season. All next season. <laughs> so. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us again, we we got our Facebook page, Two Legs of Paul McCartney Podcast. You can email us at two legs podcast at gmail.com and you can find us on Twitter at uh, Two Legs Podcast. So, as always, everybody, thank you very much for, for listening in, uh, commenting, um, you know, joining in on the discussion. We really appreciate it. So, uh, as always, everybody, have a great day and a beautiful night. So long. <laughs>